Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, quite uh, thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, uh, so uh, with uh, uh, Professor uh, Hirschfield, we thought we'd uh, ask a couple of questions just to probe uh, a little bit some, some areas. Um, I, uh, basically, uh, one of your points is that uh, for Israel, um, uh, this idea of a, uh, an East Mediterranean region uh, makes perfect sense, uh, both in its historical development of its uh, foreign policy and its uh, entire um, uh, worldview, let's say, or its local worldview. Um, and um, uh, what uh, I also took from your presentation is that um, uh, although uh, there needs to be some uh, delicate management, um, uh, especially in creating it um, with countries that in the region that are already in a conflictual adversarial posture. And uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Israel needs to handle that. Um, I, I would ask you uh, a series, and maybe we could build on these questions. Um, it was always my understanding that Israel always shied back from a commitment to alliances and so on. Uh, so this uh, Eastern Mediterranean region will uh, require a level of commitment, perhaps, in terms of diplomatic capital and other resources that Israel hasn't been uh, prepared, and understandably so, uh, hasn't been prepared to do it in the past. Um, my question is, um, first of all, is Israel uh, prepared to do this? I mean, the, the policy uh, making uh, circles and so on. Is, is it a consensus? Is there a consensus over this idea that it's a good thing and it's a good thing going I'm forward? Fearing, I'm fearing. The, the word consensus in Israel is a total contradiction in terms. <laughs> <laughs> I, take it. I, I concur. I concur. <laughs> There's no one opinion. Uh, I will try to convey the government's, I would say, uh, opinion, yes, not the okay. consensus. <laughs> <laughs> is there a, 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 a channel of thought, <laughs> let's say, which is, uh, um, which is leading towards that, that way? Um, and um, uh, first of all, my first question. And secondly, um, I, I think it really depends what model of East Mediterranean region one is envisioning because uh, uh, some, uh, some configurations of this region, if it's done in a particular way, may make it more difficult for Israel to manage and to sustain and to commit to and to draw benefits from. Uh, another model may be more conducive to and more interesting and more uh, helpful uh, for Israel. So uh, I was going to ask you, number one, is Israel prepared or to do what it needs to do, number one? And number two, uh, has there been thinking on the type of configuration, and I'll be more specific, uh, uh, traditionally, at least when we think of this, uh, everybody agrees that the main axis is Israel-Egypt. Uh, and without that axis, uh, there is no region. Uh, uh, but maybe there are other models, or if um, uh, you know uh, other members of the region coming in, uh, and especially the more strong ones. And I will not name name names, but I think uh, one uh, one can imagine what I mean. Uh, that makes a a three way partnership because of the power of particular states. Uh, so 
And, and a three-way partnership is different than a two-way plus the rest. Now, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit on, on the, if there's been any thinking more than just, yes, it's a good idea to have a region. Let's, uh, you know, sit down and construct a region. Thank you. I'm sorry for the long-winded uh, question. No, no, it's, a, it's an excellent okay. question. And, and you touched upon some really good uh, points. Um, alliance might be a very strong word, a too strong word. Uh, to describe what Israel is aspiring for in the East Mediterranean region, because Israel doesn't, uh, uh, is not in the habit of aligning itself uh, with anyone, definitely, definitely not militarily. Um, it has always, uh, due to its history or Israel's interpretation of its history, as Am uh, Levada a nation that will forever be on its own. Um, it has a history, again, a self-perceived history of being betrayed by other powers that it cooperated with, whether it's the French in 1967, whether it was uh, African countries after the oil embargo, so whether it was Iran after 1979. So this idea of, of depending too much on another country is always um, a matter of concern for Israel. And even when it comes to dependency on the U.S., uh, is something that is of concern uh, that definitely came up during the Obama administration where kind of Netanyahu tried to shift a little more to trading with China and East Europe and kind of creating more uh, because Israel doesn't like to be dependent on others and it is not in the habit of uh, joining others in military cooperation strategies, definitely not with weaker states or states that it perceives as weaker uh, than it. So if we're talking about uh, East Mediterranean region or alliance, and we're talking about a military alliance or some kind of, let's say, Israeli Navy uh, assistance to Cyprus and Greece. Sorry, I'm a, no, I understand. I, I always uh, advise people to turn these things off, but it's, easy, it's easier said than done. <laughs> So if we're talking about uh, Israel assisting Cyprus in a Navy battle with Turkey, that is not going to happen. Israel does sure. not, uh, um, has its own uh, wars and battles. It still remembers what happened the last time it tried to, right, with the Christians in Lebanon, when it tried to uh, align and militarily help others and got itself in a deep mud. And Israel has a very delicate balance where it sees Turkey as a potential, a potential uh, a cooperative country, both because it's a transit country, but also because it's the, it's the biggest standing military in Europe. Um, and uh, that is important for Israel. So the word alliance is a bit strong. What Israel is uh, seeking is economic cooperation where it feels like it has the advantage. It could uh, uh, sustain an, a situation where others depend on it a bit for its gas, et cetera, as, a, as someone who exports gas to others. But this idea of being dependent on its neighbors for a uh, major uh, energy commodity or security is something that uh, Israelis, uh, Israeli, again, there's no consensus as uh, Professor sure. Yushfeld said, but uh, Israeli government um, always strives for independence. So it will always be wary uh, of this me, kind of cooperation. Let me focus my question a little bit more. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the question of alliance is out of uh, off the table, or, or it was never on the table. Um, but uh, it, it's, um, and I do take the point that Israel is interested in cooperation and especially economic cooperation and so on. But um, it may come into some uh, 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 difficulty when, uh, let's say, a hypothetical country in the region uh, aspires to more dominance than uh, cooperation. This is what I was trying to reach for. Uh, how do you deal, yes, because you, uh, in your presentation you used the word integrate uh, all the countries, in, including uh, uh, some less cooperative countries in the region, integrating. Uh, you know, how do you see uh, this integration if, the, if one particular country has a, a, an agenda that goes beyond just being integrated and cooperation? 
uh, and especially if it links up with concepts in the region that are patently anti-Israel, uh, Islamist and, uh, you know, fundamental and uh, other issues and so on. You, you know, th there's a potential threat out there that, that I think has to be anticipated and maybe maneuvered in a way uh, when the game is set up. This is what I'm, I'm looking for. When the game of the regional system is set up, it's set up in a way that will benefit Israel. It, or will be easy for Israel to derive benefits. Let me put yes. it that way. So definitely Israel is a very pragmatic state and one that um, believes Good. that conflicts can be managed but not uh, necessarily solved ever. And some problems are just problems and, and the most you can do is create right, what Jabotinsky called an iron wall and just let your neighbors or enemies know that they can continue to be enemies if they want, but it won't help them until the moment that, they are that they're just too tired or too exhausted of trying uh, to defeat you and to a point they will never be in peace with you, but they will accept your presence and might even cooperate with you to some kind of level. And so Israel has always been very pragmatic in that sense. It has never, again, different governments and different voices. Um, but another thing that um, Israel kind of sees in its region, definitely during the Netanyahu era, is a very interest-based um, uh, type of thinking where ideology is important, but it does not um, uh, rule the international system. Um, and enemies can become friends for a moment for interests. Uh, uh, enemies can suddenly become friends. Friends can suddenly become enemies. Uh, Iran used to be a good friend of Israel and now it's not, no longer. Turkey used to be a good friend of Israel and it's no longer. And the way Israel sees it is let's manage this conflict as much as possible. Erdogan will one day not be in power anymore uh, and things can change according to the interests of the parties involved. And Israel has kind of this long breadth of let's just wait and see, let's just manage it and, and keep things cool until things might change to a point where we can start looking at things in a different way. Uh, so the most it would want to do is to keep things calm until at least Erdogan, uh, I assume that's the power you, you meant, um, at, at least until uh, he's no longer there and then we can see whether this was really an ideology or it's more kind of an interest based of someone trying to, uh, you know, uh, keep his seat and for that creates kind of uh, outside enemies to rally around the flag. Uh, Israel is no foreigner to uh, countries that suddenly become enemies or friends because suddenly the government changed and the alliances changed. Uh, Israel and Egypt is a great example of this. Uh, the Israel-Egypt axis is, I agree, the most important axis for the stability of the Middle East. It is uh, the, the rivalry between Israel and Egypt was once almost caused a nuclear exchange between the Americans and the Soviets in this, uh, in this region. Uh, and it is the main reason for why the U.S. has decided to become all in in the region after 1973 and the Arab oil embargo, realizing that if Israel and Egypt do not cooperate and are not in peace with one another, then um, maritime trade is blocked, then oil prices go up, then there is a threat between uh, powers. And so Israel-Egypt cooperation has always been very, very important. And for the U.S., it has been critical. So... Um, this idea that other powers will come and somehow intervene in this axis between Israel and Egypt, whether it is Russia, whether it is another power, is not something that the U.S., even a disengaged U.S., would agree uh, to happen. Uh, the U.S. pays a lot of money every year to make sure that this axis continues. It pays $3 billion to Israel every year and a uh, little less to uh, Egypt every year to keep this peace in one place. And I agree that without this peace, there is no uh, East Mediterranean region to speak of, and there's barely any Middle East uh, as, as, as a one region to speak of that is not in constant war. So that is definitely the most important thing, and I do not think that the U.S. would allow anyone to come in between its role as the mediator and the, and the guarantor of that stability between these two countries. Do, do you see um, the, a, a proper model of an East Mediterranean uh, be part of, not take 
uh, the place of, but be a part of the security architecture, the Western security architecture of the of the region. Of the East Mediterranean region? Yeah. Of... Without uh, calling uh, this East Mediterranean, whatever it's going to be, uh, an alliance of any sort, I'm not going there, but I'm saying this cooperation, this Eastern, well, we, we came up with a name, uh, we called it an East Mediterranean Commonwealth, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better term. So the creation of this uh, concept like this, um, uh, would it be incorporated, do you see it as being incorporated in a, in a, in a Western security architecture, a, a new security architecture, yeah. or it would be a parallel thing? I've, I'm very doubtful that, uh, that a security architecture can come out from uh, the East Mediterranean uh, region, because at the end of the day, uh, Israel and Egypt might cooperate in terms of uh, security between them, but I doubt you will see kind of this full on military cooperation, even between Israel and Egypt, which are in peace. So not to speak of Israel and Lebanon, not to speak of Israel and Syria, not to speak of Turkey and Greece and Cyprus. So it will never be, it's always going to be a fractured region. I don't see uh, any more than that. But if we take kind of a, you can say a neoliberal stance where you accept the fact that there's anarchy, you accept the fact that there's always kind of this limit to how much cooperation can happen, but you can mitigate as much as possible yeah the situation where it becomes uh, uh, violent or, or is through economic trade as much as possible. So I agree with your term of, of a commonwealth, which is kind of the most we can aspire for. Uh, have the economic trade uh, between the countries and between the, the region and other regions uh, stronger to the point where you, you will escalate, you might escalate uh, conflicts in the region, but, but there's a, a limit where if you escalate it too much, the costs will outweigh the, the benefit because everybody will lose. Um, and that's the most you can aspire to. So when we say East Mediterranean region, we, we are speaking of a rather fractured region that is in no sense like the European Union or even the North American kind of uh, cooperation. Um, it's a very limited but, economic but this, based. This fractured character of it uh, uh, begs the question, of the role of Russia. Um, you, you've you've yeah. said uh, uh, quite uh, uh, clearly that, that for Israel, it would prefer uh, that Russia has a limited role, but uh, Russia has a role already. It's already in the region. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it's a matter again of managing somehow uh, the presence of Russia in, in the way for it to be constructive rather than destructive, uh, if that can be uh, a term. Uh, I uh, agree. Uh, Israel cooperates with Russia. Russia is a, is a major regional power and, uh, and Israel doesn't have, it, it, out of necessity, it has to cooperate with Russia definitely when it comes to Syria and its presence in Syria and Iran. It can't be too confrontational with it, although it sells weapons to Poland and to other countries in East European that are directed towards protecting themselves from Russia. So that is always a cause of tension between the two countries. Um, but at the end of the day for Israel, Russia and the Soviet Union before it has always been a problematic uh, character in the region that has supported Israel's enemies, definitely when, when we're talking about Israel, Egypt. Um, the, Israel would like to limit as much as possible Russia's uh, involvement in the region, although it, it understands but limited it can't. To, to Syria, let's say, or I, I mean, it, it's an integral part of the Syrian regime at the moment, uh, you know, regime came, uh, change uh, notwithstanding. Um, uh, but what, what sort of is the minimal Russian involvement that, that in your view, Israel could live with? Uh, what, what is now, or you know, obviously? <laughs> Israel doesn't get to decide. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we think of ourselves as a, as a power, but we um, uh, adapt to the region around us, and we don't really have a say over which powers come in. Um, but as much as possible, the, the fact that Russia is now in, in Syria, uh, on the one hand, is a cause for concern. On the other hand, it is better than to create a power vacuum there, which Iran will come in. So Iran is there, but its role is rather limited 
because Russia is also there. And a chaotic, uh, a fractured Syria is also not good news for Israel. It wants, even if it's Assad, it's better than just chaos and, and um, jihadists running around next to Israel's borders. So the fact that Russia is there and manages to stabilize the area is not uh, terrible news uh, for Israel. But um, the thing with Russia is that it, it never limits itself to, um, to that. It's always kind of like a bear hug where, you know, a bear hugs you. He hugs you so hard that he cracks your bones. And, and kills you. So you always are wary of what it means to get to get assistance from Russia. Where does it lead to? Why are you being given this assistance? And it is always a cause for concern to Israel that once Russia finds itself in a country around it, its influence uh, only grows. Suddenly, it becomes weapons exports, and those weapons tend to be directed towards Israel at the end of the day, even if at the beginning they're directed towards local rebels. So it's always a cause for concern for Israel, and definitely in relations with the U.S. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, I've heard Russians make uh, the, the uh, you know the point uh, or uh, insist on the point that that Russian foreign policy today is not the Soviet Union's foreign policy, and all they want to be is included. They want a stake uh, in what's happening. Uh, how do you do? You buy that argument, or you know, do you give credence to that, or? Or is what you say that once uh, the bear begins to hug you, it doesn't just give you warmth, it gives you fractures, <laughs> bone, bone fractures. Yeah. So I know it's, it's important to understand, you know, when we're talking about grievances and, and power dynamics, it's important to understand both sides. So I do understand that perspective that uh, Russians have. They're not the Soviet Union. Throughout its history, Russia has been invaded by Europe and not the other way around usually. Um, this idea that I, I completely understand Russia's interest in East Ukraine, this idea of not letting NATO beyond the Dnieper, um, right? This idea of keeping guard over uh, Moscow, it's a, I, I completely understand that perspective and why it's uh, Russia's but, national interest. But without interest, linking but... that to, the East, to, to our region, our region is sui generis, I think. I mean, it's, it's separate in itself. Exactly. So... You know, the role of Russia here was always traditionally was to protect the, or it's the excuse to protect the Oriental Christians and then to, you know, in its struggle against uh, the Ottoman Empire and, blah, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it, there's always a reason. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I, I understand the reason okay. where they're talking about Ukraine. But when we're talking about our region... I don't understand who exactly they're protecting um, that uh, need that protection. Um, it seems like kind of uh, keeping tabs on making sure that we're not becoming too much of an energy uh, exporter to not threaten their markets. Um, it is ve it's a very self-interested kind of- You made the uh, point, I think, very succinctly that they want an excuse to keep military presence in the region behind exactly. the uh, behind any problems that they may yes. have. Yes, and again, I, so I understand that. Uh, yeah. And I understand that. You have NATO and you have the Warsaw Pact. You don't have the Warsaw Pact anymore, but you still have NATO. So for the way they see it, NATO is a threat. I understand that perspective. And because of that, they want presence in the East Mediterranean. But the I understand is, their interests. How I just far don't think that, it's good news for Israel. How far does that become destabilizing is the question for Israel and for everybody here. Because you know you you understand one can understand their motives, but uh, they, it stops where they begin to affect the stability of the region, which is what uh, the members of the region want. I think most most of all, and what uh, is good for Western security, uh, because we we have to remember that we are part of the West, we're not part of the East, and I think we will always be. Uh, so. Do you see the U.S. really, uh, you know, it's withdrawing, but it's not withdrawing. It's sort of shifting its, uh, its resources around in the region. It's uh, beefing up certain presence in Greece. It's, uh, you know, uh, what is the U.S. doing in, in your estimation? You know, how does this affect the region? I mean, uh, again, the, the possibility of creating a region. So the U.S. Uh, always oscillates, uh, moves back and forth when it comes to the Middle East. In, in an ideal world, the U.S. would have liked to disengage as much as it can from the Middle East and pivot to 
what it sees as bigger threats, which is mainly in East Asia, South China Sea, Taiwan, etc. Having said that, U.S. repeatedly throughout its history learns that it could leave the Middle East, but the Middle East doesn't leave the U.S. Um, yeah. And sooner or later, something happens. Iran attacks an oil installation in Saudi Arabia, or another power comes in and destabilizes, and the U.S. is sucked in into the Middle East. And if it's not the US, before that it was the British and there always needs to be a major power in the area. And that's not going to change in the next few decades. We, we tend to think that uh, as oil um, becomes, or as we move to a more decarbonized uh, uh, energy system and we will use eventually less oil, then the Middle East will become uh, less important. And that might be true 60 years from now. But in the short to medium term, the Middle East will become even more important because if demand for oil will go down eventually as we move to hydro uh, to uh, hydrogen and, and uh, whenever that happens, the demand will go down and the price of oil will go down. But we'll still need oil for a lot of things, whether it's transportation or plastics or rubber, etc. And while expensive oil fields will will collapse because the price of oil will be too low for them to make sense, like fracking in the U.S like Canada, like England, like Norway will not uh, uh, take oil out of the ground anymore. The Middle East has the cheapest oil there is. Even at $7 a barrel, it still makes a profit in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. So if anything, the role of the Middle East as the major oil provider of the world will only increase in the next 20 uh, to 30 years. And, and the US can't disengage with that. Um, so it will always want a presence and will not allow too much uh, of other powers uh, to come in. To, so it will always try to create a limit. Uh, for Israel, it's a boon because Israel always presents itself to the U.S. as kind of a protector of Western interests in the region. Um, but I can't predict uh, what will be the tipping point, what can create an instability that will draw in uh, uh, more troops. Yeah, here, uh, can I pass it to you? <laughs> Okay, um, I um, agree with Ilya and disagree with him quite a lot of issues. Now let me speak about the history. Um, historically, um, we had in the, from 57, 58 onwards, um, Israel was very proud of what we called the um, Peripheral Alliance. Um, they were called the Alliance, the Hebrew word is Brit with the periphery. Yeah. Um, and the concept, the concept then was actually not Israel, Turkey, um, Ethiopia, Iran, um, but the concept was United States, Israel, Turkey, Ethiopia, Iran. It was an American in, it was, came out of the, the um, Eisenhower doctrine and it was part uh, of an alliance system. Um, I um, agree with Ilya on, this, on, the, uh, on the concept that we like to be, we've been, we've been betrayed too often, too many times by, and Ilya gave a list of them. Um, but um, on the other hand, um, you have today the, the EMGF, the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, you have the emergence of the um, a similar structure in the Red Sea where we're not part of it, but we've got most vital interests there. And um, um, to, um, I don't think, I don't think Adelia said that, but to leave it only to energy uh, and trade, I don't think that that is in any way possible. Um, you cannot, uh, you cannot ignore the fact that trade roads need to be secured. Um, and you cannot ignore the fact that ideology and jihadist ideology or Muslim brother ideology plays a major role in the behavior of issues. And ideology is today a bigger threat, is a threat to Israel than the conservative, the, the, the former way of it. And, um, this makes, I believe it makes it necessary the, um, to come to far closer terms of understandings with, an organ with a group that doesn't exist maybe, but is very important, 
and this is Europe. <laughs> we have the same, we have a lot of very common interests in Europe and the connection Israel, e Israel, Egypt, Greece, Israel, Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, European Union is of tremendous importance. And I think it has to complement our relations with the United States, not to conquer. Now on the Palestine, on the Israel, if you look at the ideology, ideological, the strongest opposition against Muslim brethren, uh, jihadist thinking, is the what we call the Arab Quartet. Um, it's not only Egypt, but it's definitely also Jordan, and it is United Arab Emirates and hopefully the Saudi Arabia. And uh, any coordinated structure we can build with the four Arab Quartet nations, um, with American and European support, um, will make make us move quite substantially in that direction. Um, my sense is that um, uh, Turkey and Qatar are far greater threat than um, we intend to um, to agree. Um, I told I don't know, I told you before that um, I I was asked to have um, um, a dialogue with um, I was with the National Security Council to have a dialogue with um, who was then vice vice president of Turkey. Um, Mr. Kotlmuz, and uh, we did this as to check the official negotiations. We did it with General Simon Hefetz. And, and that was most pleasant and wonderful and all economic and uh, nice blah, blah. But it was very clear that what the Turks had in mind was to undermine Egypt, get the Muslim brethren again up into Egypt, and <laughs> strengthen Qatar, the most outrageous radical militant positions. And it would be suicidal for Israel to, to cooperate with that. Now, play games and do a little bit of conflict management, I think Elia is right, but you know. And um, uh, now on Russia, on Russia, you know, there were different times. Um, I grew up um, long before Elia was alive, when um, uh, Russia uh, threatened to destroy Israel. Well, the, there was the Bulgarian letter, and in 1967, um, they um, they said that um, Israel will not exist anymore in three months. They told this to to, Ephraim, to Moshe Snell, to Yaakov Hazan. And um, that our love and fear for Russia, for the Soviet Union, is all there. It's deep in the inside. It goes also way back back for the last 400 centuries. Um, but on the other hand, under, under Paris, and, uh, when Paris was prime minister, we um, um, opened up relations with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, and we were the go-between between Moscow and Washington. This is definitely a role Israel would like to play. Um, so uh, I agree with Elia, but it is, um, I only want a little bit to to address. Now, how we manage it, um, I am, um, I, I don't agree with the statement that Israeli politics are always rational. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with, um, with anything you said. I think it's just um, kind of different yeah, emphasis. I know. That we're putting. I agree that jihadist ideology is a major threat and um, is responsible for a lot of the problems that we see in this region. Um, but that is not a state, right? So one of the uh, threats to Israel is destabilizing the states around us. Uh, whether it's Assad, whether it's the King of Jordan, it's better to have a state authority, which tends to think much more rationally than a collapse of a state. And then you have this jihadist kind of uh, extremist ideology that uh, is a threat to everyone. So Israel has a, an interest in strengthening state authorities. Um, and when I say Israel, also the US, et cetera, because the idea, or at least the hope is that state authorities tend to be more rational players than non-states, uh, which are a major problem in this region, uh, which is unstable as it is. Um, and definitely in that sense, Israel plays a major role for all of the 
powers in the area, whether it's Europe, whether it's the US, whether it's Russia, which is to help keep the state stable, whether it's to help Jordan and the Jordanian king uh, and its stability, now selling it water, right, the New Deal, um, whether it's to help the Egyptians against ISIS in, in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, there's always this sense that um, Israel is, a, is an important force to have, even though Europe has a lot of disagreements with it regarding the Palestinians, because Israel helps stabilize the countries around it as well. Um, having said that, yes, I agree completely. Israel uh, seeks European support. It seeks European trade. It seeks European, um, it sees itself as somewhat European, you can say, right? There's a, a, some complications there where we kind of came from Europe, but also angry at Europe for the history of right, anti-Semitism, et cetera. So it's a complicated relationship, but definitely Israel seeks European support, but it's mainly economic support. Um, the defense establishment in Israel doesn't see Europe as a reliable security um, uh, support or assistance. It just sees itself as kind of living in two different worlds or two different spheres when it comes to what is a threat when do you use power? When do you use violence? Israel sees itself as much more aligned with the US and even with Russia to a point than it is with Europe and how the European Union sees uh, and views threats and views how it should uh, deal uh, with threats. So it definitely, there's a limit to how much Israel, again, Israel wants to trade. The European Union is Israel's biggest trade partner. But when it comes to security assurances, there is, no, uh, there is no one other than the U.S. that Israel would trust. And so we constantly see the Europeans throw a lot of money, for example, on the peace processes, always throw a lot of money, a lot of weight. But at the end of the day, it's an American standing between an Israeli and an Arab leader and uh, shaking hands. It's never a European. Um, because Israel will always limit the amount of involvement of European leaders because you just see it as a completely different um, worldview. So it's always uh, going to be a little uh, limit. Um, regarding Turkey and Qatar being uh, the major threats, um, again, I, I, I definitely Qatar is a threat. It is a kind of a malevolent force that, uh, that has been annoying, not just us, but Saudi, the other Gulf states, the other moderate Sunni states. Um, Turkey is a complicated issue. I can't I can't call it an enemy. I can definitely not call it a friend. It's not a friend of Israel, but it's a competitor and a, and a, a rival, but it's still also a trade partner for Israel and the major transit country for Israel's oil. And um, it's, it's a complicated situation. Um, definitely Turkey has its own interests that it uses Israel as a scapegoat or as a rallying around the flag or every time something happens in Turkey, that destabilizes it, where the lira falls, then suddenly the Palestinian issue is so important uh, all of a sudden for Erdogan. Um, definitely, Israel doesn't really have anything to do right now until, until that leadership changes. Um, preferably the party itself uh, falls, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Until then, Israel needs to manage uh, and play its cards right. Uh, but I don't think that... Um, designating that country as an enemy will be of benefit to Israel. Uh, it will always want to walk between the drops and wait until things change, so not to burn the bridge with Turkey that it worked for decades to build and will not give up so uh, easily. Yeah, here, any more questions or comments? No, we... By and large, we almost say the same. Not fully. Not, Not fully. fully. Um, um, you know... Um, well, that's uh, consensus in Israel, right? Uh, almost, <laughs> but not fully. You know, um, uh, I think I'm more aware of um, changes that happen than Ilya. Um, I... Um, I, I was too small to remember that in 1948, the most important ally of Israel was Russia and the Czechoslovakian yeah. thing we got. And then in the um, 50s, you had the United States saying that um, um, a guy called John Foster Dulles said, 
Israel is a millstone around our neck and pushes us down. And the United States behaved outrageously against Israel. And, um, and, um, and then um, France and Germany were our allies. Yeah. And then the United States became our ally. And um, so I've been, I've been through more, more. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it happen. I've been, well, yeah. I've been through a longer period of time, um, by definition. Um, and um, I'm by profession a uh, historian and not, I think, a political scientist. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I, I'm very suspicious to political scientists from a disciplinary point of view. Because, um, uh, and, um, and so um, my sense is that um, the security realities that Elia is describing are true. They are accurate. And the fact that we don't see Turkey as the total enemy that we want to maintain relations. And we want to maintain relations with Iran after they, after the we regime change there. Yeah. And uh, um, the regime in, in Iran, it turns out in one way or the other totally. Um, and um, the game, the Israeli game will be always to work together. But um, if I'm looking forward in the next five to 10 years, my sense is that um, without a close understanding with Europe, backed by the United States, the United States will want it because they want to move out. And a better understanding also of the ideological um, thing. And the fact that um, that soft power is often more important than hard power. And we can speak of what Ami Alon calls smart power. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to tell the Europeans they, they have all kinds of interests and they do exactly the opposite against their own interests in many ways in the Middle East. And I can give a lot of details on that. Um, but if we, um, if we fight, if we um, convince them that there are, that um, Israel is a major role to play in um, in strengthening European interests in the Mediterranean, security-wise, ideological-wise, democracy-wise, um, the, in the height uh, on the way to for climate change, for water, and all of these issues, we are a major partner. And on this far closer, and on this, I, I view um, Egypt. Jordan, uh, hopefully also Saudi Arabia, but definitely in Cyprus and Greece is a major bridge in doing that. Um, and um, so um, I wouldn't maybe not speak of an alliance relationship, but a far stronger structure of coordination and cooperation. Um, I completely agree. And I, I agree with everything you said and you've definitely seen these uh, friends become enemies, enemies becomes friends, right? I, five years ago, I wouldn't have guessed in a million years of, that the Abrahamic Accords would be a thing um, without solving, right, the Palestinian issue. I would just maybe end with uh, addressing the elephant in the room that you can call it, is the Palestinian issue and how that might affect the viability of this uh, continued strengthening cooperation because so long as Israel's conflict with the Palestinians is limited to Israel versus Hamas, um, that is something that uh, the Sunni Arab states are willing to accept. They don't like Hamas either. They don't like the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Gulf states are willing to accept that. Egypt is willing to accept that. Having said that, if Abu Mazen um, dies, he's old, he's overweight, he's a heavy smoker, uh, his days are are limited and if he doesn't have a successor and that will start a battle over succession of the West Bank and who is more anti-Israel or more defiant of Israel to win the support of the youth that really don't like Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority. If that erupts again, then all of the things that we hope for in the region and Israel being the center of it uh, will come into peril. So that's something that we need to take into account. We might be on a bar borrowed time until that happens. And we need to strengthen this, uh, not alliance, but cooperation as much as possible so that if things don't go well with the West Bank, uh, everything that we've built so far might hit a wall that so far we haven't seen or thought that it doesn't exist anymore. I have no idea how much I fully agree, but I'm not sure if the, the concluding, the, the logical conclusion of what you say, I will be the same. 
because the logic is that um, Israel can play a far more proactive role in, um, in easing the situation of the Palestinians and building bridges there. And um, uh, the opposite was done under the former government for the last 15 years. I don't know who will be prime minister in these years. I'm joking. <laughs> and, um, and also he did some good things. I mean, the negotiations, there were interesting negotiations. And, um, um, and this government is um, a chameleon, not a chameleon, but it is a, a very complex combination. There's a lot of goodwill to do a lot of things. Um, yeah. and, but I agree with you that we, we cannot ignore the Palestinian issue. The Palestinian issue is for Israel in many ways very, very central. And there are, but there are many ways to do it. It's not something that is out. Uh, I must say, I don't know, we ever spoke with Chris about it. Uh, I'm very, very critical of my friends from the Israeli, what I call radical left. I think they cause a lot of damage. I, cause, I believe that the radical right is probably worse. Um, but um, we have to deal with it. Mr. Rettig, thank you very much. Thank you. And we hope uh, we'll have these conversations in the future, if you don't mind. Uh, we'll come back. <laughs> I enjoyed well, it very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure much. to meet you, Elia. Pleasure to meet you, Professor Lusfeld.